So if we're thinking about complex global emergencies, it's actually quite helpful to go back to 2015, so five years before the pandemic, a really important moment in global history. Two fundamental global agreements were signed off. On the one hand, the Paris Agreement around climate change, and on the other hand, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And what we have then seen with much more concrete targets in the run-up to COVID is that um, the general public, politicians, were able to observe how we were performing against a whole range of very ambitious, very important targets for human development. And what we have also seen is that we were failing from year to year to even begin on the trajectory of change that was required. Patience was running out, people went to the street, and we have seen on many fronts that we are reframing our targets around climate and the responses, the responses to many of the social goals being converted into a, what we call, an emergency narrative. And that, of course, was then really picked up under COVID, a maybe more obvious, complex global emergency, but it also really has helped us to start to begin to appreciate that the world is now dealing with an entirely different type of emergency situation than let's call them the routine emergencies which particular cities uh, and local governments are often exposed to but also non-routine uh, emergencies like earthquakes, flood events, maybe terrorism, these extreme events which are all quite visible, they are quite clearly detectable by not just the political leadership but also by civil society. But the kind of emergencies, these global complex emergencies I'm referring to, are of a different nature. They are long, they are political, they involve very difficult perceived or real trade-offs sometimes between lives and livelihoods. They are featuring enormous risks for societies and of course uh, are exposed to the urgency to act. And it's in that context where we have set up the Emergency Governance Initiative uh, which is a partnership between LSE cities at the London School of Economics, UCLG, United Cities and Local Governments, and Metropolis, a city and regional government network. If you then think about how governments reacted, whether it's under COVID or even started responding to uh, climate uh, change over many years or decades in, in the latter case, uh, you will inevitably appreciate that this needs to be a concerted response across different tiers of government, different levels, from the supranational scaled all the way down to the city and local uh, level as well. That requires, on the one hand, an agreement of how political power is distributed and, on the other hand, enormous coordination efforts. And it has not been easy to, under the COVID situation, to really provide for the right distribution of responsibilities and uh, for the right kind of coordination. And that's where cities and regions have actually tried to invent new mechanisms to get involved and report back to national or supranational go governments through boards and committees. They have tried to set up uh, networks that were first consolidating information from the bottom up. Here in London we had a network of boroughs were really bringing together information on schools and public health and then called the minister and informed about these actions. City networks themselves have get in, gotten involved in uh, trying to inform the discourse on what are specific policy domains where cities can also take the lead and are not just on the receiving end by national governments and other sort of national institutions have invented new committees where indeed national government meets with local and regional government. The idea of multi-level governance, a quite technical term, is actually quite fundamental if we're thinking about emergency responses. This is all about how different tiers of government, from the supranational to the national, the state, the city and the local, work together to address policy issues. If you move into the complex emergencies, you need to do this very quickly and you do have to rely on the great competencies in different policy domains. How do you do it? Well, first you need to really think hard about where does the power for the emergency response rest? Who should really take the lead for what kind of area? There has been a bit of a tendency of renationalizing and re-centralizing these responsibilities. And on the other hand, you need to think about coordination. Cities and regions have really done uh, quite a great deal under COVID to become better at reporting back to 
national governments, but not only reporting back, but ideally sitting at the table when key decisions are being made about those areas where they can affect change and support local residents on the ground. The most fundamental question may be when we think of governance and the institutions that uh, we have to equip with the capacity to respond to complex emergencies is about both the tension and the synergy with democracy. We have heard a lot about this at all levels during COVID, the debates about to what extent climate action is representative of the will of the people or not are relatively pronounced. And of course, at the city level, we have seen actions on the ground changing our daily routines and lives where the question of how can these be legitimized by democratic practices was quite and will continue to be quite fundamental. We have to appreciate that there are some inherent tensions. If we have to react quite rapidly, we don't have the time for a lot of coordination and consultation and engagement. If we want to interact uh, with uh, these crises in a radical way and respond radically, that also requires quite a lot of executive power and uh, power is always uh, something that is difficult to concentrate if you want to account for proper democratic processes. But on the other hand, there are also areas where there are real synergies. The emergencies do generate a lot of public interest. They are able to uh, activate and motivate uh, citizens to get involved, to think about uh, how this could be solved collectively uh, and at a minimum level uh, really creates strong opinions about um, how we should collectively respond to these emergencies. So they are also a, um, a feeding ground for better practices. Now, cities, once again, you could argue are a pretty good context to improve and stabilize democratic practices, particularly at a moment where there's great fragility about these uh, approaches and where there's enormous polarization in society. Uh, we have uh, seen that uh, there were responses around engaging with civil society through data generation, which are highly innovative. The city of Taipei has enabled its civic tech community to provide very innovative uh, mapping data information to its citizen. We have seen innovation around representative democracy to stabilize local elections, try to think about how they can take place even if there are lockdowns. And we have of course have had major uh, uh, push towards a greater involvement of citizens in some of these uh, quite tough decisions around the idea of citizen assemblies or uh, citizen juries. Again, there are a couple of cities that have really taken the lead, uh, where the mayor, for example, in Augsburg convened a group of 10 representative citizens on a regular basis to really think through how the city could respond to the crisis. In other very difficult contexts, we have seen coalitions of civil society, the church, other institutions come together and really help government to pacify the uh, context they were confronted with. The city of Cali in Colombia, confronted by a lot of civil unrest about a year ago, uh, was really only able to pacify uh, the situation, quite a dire situation in the street uh, by bringing broad urban coalitions together to mitigate and uh, address the concerns. A final example, the city of Lyon uh, has set up uh, what some people refer to as a digital wallet where residents are not only submitting information around health and other key uh, areas of concern, but they can control the information that is being shared and uh, they can also curate the information that is being provided. These are all uh, examples that cut across uh, potentially sort of the four or five main area we need to be concerned about when we talk about democracy and the emergency. There is of course participation, but there's also engagement and deliberation, debate. There's representation, our parliaments and the institutions that go with it. There's good governance and finally there's also the question of rights. Well, the broad uh, question of emergency response feels like a rather dire subject. I think it's important to remember that these experiences uh, many of us had under uh, COVID, of course, also included um, a recognition of uh, broader changes possible uh, and that in some areas as a byproduct of radical action, uh, there were uh, real discoveries of improvements in uh, the city of Chandigarh in northern India.
residents, many for the first time, were able to see the Himalayans uh, because of the massive reduction in air pollution. Uh, we have uh, in other uh, parts of the world been rediscovering our local neighborhoods, maybe also our neighbors, and are able nowadays to maybe engage with the local dimension of our cities in a much more productive way. And we have, maybe the most important point, uh, been able to reconnect with nature, not just where the natural habitat is very prominent, but precisely in urban areas where usually uh, nature is not really um, reflected upon that much and also not being encountered as much. That was the situation under COVID. All of those experiences help us to come together based on a common experience to then ultimately address the much more fundamental question of how can we democratically address uh, questions of radical and rapid interventions.